the is brought to you by the National Research Hub, the Auto Aid Nigeria Research Hub. And I am Dr. Fumilayo Dohati, I'm the um, national coordinator. So before we begin, I just want to read a few, uh, a, a brief profile about our presenter. Uh, Dr. Farouk Azam Ratori is a consultant an associate professor in rehabilitation, medicine and pain specialist. He's also a teacher and a mentor. He has more than 200 publications with 3,800 citations. And Hello, he, has I'm also, not he has also won multiple national and international awards, travel grants and scholarship. He's also an editorial board member of several journals. And he's also the national representative of Pakistan for the International Society of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Dr. Farouk is passionate about teaching, research writing, and he has conducted more than 120 workshops in various fields, uh, ranging from medical writing, research ethics, and so on. Uh, join me to welcome Doctor, you can link up with him on LinkedIn. I'll share his LinkedIn uh, uh, profile in the chat box. So join me to welcome Dr. Farouk as he begins his presentation. Dr. Farouk, you are welcome uh, to the virtual podium. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Doherty. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, so without wasting yes. any time, I'll uh, start with my presentation. Just give me a second. Uh, so can you please uh, confirm that you can share, uh, you can see my slides? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to start. So again, thank you very much, uh, Nigerian Hub of Author Aid, uh, for the invitation and all this uh, management. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Duharti, for the invitation. So I'm going to do a quick webinar on an introduction to the use of artificial intelligence tools in the medical research and writing, because this is right now the buzzword. And everyone is talking about it, but still uh, for people like us based in developing countries who do not have access to most of these tools, I mean the professional version and the full version, uh, and we don't have a formal training session in our institutes and in our uh, hospitals. So sometimes it becomes difficult to understand that what these tools can do, uh, what are their limitations and what are the ethical aspects that must be considered while using these AI tools. So this is going to be an introductory webinar that would cover most of these aspects. So uh, again, uh, guys, uh, let me tell you that the world is changing and it's changing at a very fast pace. So this was an article, uh, uh, a global survey that was published in Nature around six months back in October 23. And as you can see, it was a global survey of around 1600 researchers from different parts of the world, mostly developed part of the world like Europe and Northern America, but it also included people from developed world, Africa, Southeast Asia and other countries. And these were the results. Number one, almost one third of them said that they had used AI generative tool to help them write manuscript at some stage. One third, right? It was six months back. Then around 15% of them said that they had used them to help write them grant applications. I'm not sure how many of you are into writing grant application, but you need to understand that it is the process of evolution. You are a researcher. First of all, you write articles, then you go up and you try to write grant. You try to win grants. Uh, and once you win a grant, it actually sets in, uh, into play a sort of a positive feedback loop where you get more grants because you're already a grant winner. So people have been using these AI tools in writing grant applications as well. And this is very, very important for people like us who do not have English as their primary language, as their main mother tongue. And, they are, and, and because of the global norms, we are supposed to write articles in English language in order to compete with the global north. So again, 55%, that is more than half of the respondents felt that a major benefit of generative AI tools like ChatGPT and many other that I'm going to discuss is ability to edit and translate writing for researcher whose first language is not English. So whenever I talk about ChatGPT and AI tools, most of the young researchers, specifically in medical, biomedical fields, you know, you, they think as if it is a magic tool. They would give it some commands some prompts and the tool is going to churn out a whole research article for them. 
This is not the way to use an AI tool. Uh, it is not going to work this way. But if you want to use these AI tools to improve the quality of your writing, specifically the language, grammar, and syntax part, it is going to enhance your writing and make it possible for you to publish in high-ranking biomedical journals. Because one of the major issues that people like us face while we are competing with the uh, people uh, uh, from um, Europe and America, that you know we sometimes do really good work, work that is unique, work that is impactful. But when it comes to writing, our writing is not as good as the people who are based in those countries and who have English as their first language. So these AI tools can actually help us to uh, create and write and improve the quality of our writing so that we can compete and we can also publish in high-ranking biomedical journals. Before I formally start, a couple of disclaimers just to make myself clear. First of all, this presentation or webinar is based on my own personal experience and views that have been uh, formed after I started using chat GPT like most of you in November 2022, number one. Uh, number two, please remember, I am a physician. I'm a medical doctor with a background in pain medicine and bioethics. So I do not have much uh, knowledge about, let's say, social sciences, agriculture sciences, computer sciences. So uh, this is based on my experience of using AI tools as a medical doctor. It is impossible to cover all AI tools and all aspects in a one hour webinar. So, I mean, I'm going to touch upon certain aspects, then probably we can do a long follow up session. And whenever I share a particular tool, and please remember there are more than a thousand tools available in the market right now. And whenever I use a tool or I mention a tool, it is not an endorsement. Please go online. I will, I'm going to share the links with you. Use that tool. Um, I mean, experiment with that tool. You like that tool, use that. You find a better tool, please go for that. And please uh, also understand that uh, this is basically a four hour hands-on training session that I have squeezed into a one hour webinar. So I'm sorry, but I'm not going to do a lot of, uh, I mean, any hand-on training because I'm going to focus more on uh, oral delivery of my lecture, didactics, and then probably a 15 to 20 minutes question answer session. Oh, Ground rules, uh, please oh, no, 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 no. use chat to answer questions. Number two, please, no side chats, please. And please keep mic muted at all times. Uh, I would again request all of you to please check. Some of you don't have their mics muted and it's creating a little bit of uh, disturbance. Please keep your mics muted all times. If you want to ask a question, I mean, use the chat box. If you want to express yourself, use the virtual hand. I would request the organizer to please keep an eye on the chat box. And if there's something very important, they can stop me in the middle and I'm going to answer that question. Otherwise, we are going to have around a 20 minute Q&A session at the end. And please participate actively. This is not a lecture. I mean, this is not, not, not a classroom. Uh, this is an exchange information session. You are like 91 people attending this webinar. You come from different parts of the world. And I'm pretty sure some of you are much more uh, experienced in different tools than myself. So please do share your experience. And whenever I ask a question, please do give an answer in the chat box. So for those, I mean, at least initially people used to think that this AI is something very different, very unique. It is something that is only restricted to countries like USA, Japan, maybe China, European countries. And, you know, people like us who are based in developing world, I mean, we, what we have to do with artificial intelligence and what to talk about artificial intelligence in medical research and writing, probably we are not using it and we might not be able to use it. I just want you to know and realize and just pause for a moment. Artificial intelligence is already deeply ingrained and it's part of our, your, my daily life for more than two decades. I'll give you uh, examples. You do Google search. So your Google search is based on algorithms. Why? In a single household, my Google search shows different results and my brother's Google search shows different results because we have different backgrounds, we have different laptops, and although we are searching for the same thing, the uh, search that comes up is different. All of us use Google Maps and the Google Maps change in the real time. What's happening? It's all artificial intelligence algorithm working at the back end. Gmail, Google Workspace. So if those of you who have activated the Google Workspace and the Google Labs in their Gmail, which I have done, and I, I would recommend that you should do as well. So, you know, you can have smart answer to your Gmail. You can improve your answer. You can expand your answer. You can paraphrase your answer. It is all based on artificial intelligence tools. Social media profiles, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. People have different tastes, and that's why people get different fields. It is all feeds. It's all based on artificial intelligence algorithms. Then many of you have this facial recognition software in which out of 8 billion people in the world, 
your mobile phone, smartphone is going to open up only when it sees your face. What's happening? Who is controlling all this? It's all based on artificial intelligence algorithm. Your online shopping, Alibaba, Amazon, different uh, recommendation for different people in the same household, all based on artificial intelligence. Netflix, YouTube. So just to summarize, artificial intelligence was already part of our daily lives for more than two decades. Just because we were not maybe primarily uh, interested in technology, or maybe in my case, I'm a medical doctor. I did not have an in-depth understanding of these tools. So probably I did not understand that how AI is integrated into my daily life. So it was part of that, right? Now the question is that, you know, have you ever used an AI in research and writing? And there are three options. You have to answer either of them. Yes, no, or I am not sure. I'll wait for 30 seconds and see your responses in your uh, in the chat box. Okay, yes. Hello, Alam, how are you? Excellent. So, so this is actually a paradigm shift. I have been doing, okay, so still there are people who say no, no problem. Uh, probably you, you guys are using it, but you don't realize I'll uh, uh, explain it to you. So this is a paradigm shift. As you can see that most of the people say that they have been using artificial intelligence tool in research and writing. When I started doing this, I probably I did this webinar first time for the larger author aid community as a tea time around one year back. Uh, it was around March 2023. And most of the people, now more than 90% said that, no, we have never used AI tool in research and writing. So which means the world is changing. People are exploring and people are doing uh, things that they were not doing in the past. So we'll discuss that. Uh, just let me know, yes or no. Have any one of you used any of the following Grammarly and any other language enhancement software or website? Okay, yes. Reference management software, maybe like Zotero, Mendeley, EndNote. Again, the answer for, from most of our colleagues is yes, all three. Excellent. Okay. Paraphrasing tool, maybe like Quillbot, Rightful, and other tools. Okay. Uh, not specific Quillbot, any tool. Okay. And even if you have not used any of the tools that I have mentioned so far, I'm pretty sure that you guys have used at least Google Documents and Microsoft Office, Microsoft PowerPoint, Microsoft Word. You need to understand that AI has been integrated in both of these, Google Documents and Microsoft Office. So even if you have not used any of the first three, you at the minimum have must have used Google Documents to create some documents, some Excel sheets, or maybe Microsoft Office which is the basics for at least everyone who is into research and writing around the globe. And these tools have now AI integrated in them. So you need to understand that actually you have been using artificial intelligence, sometimes knowingly and sometimes unknowingly. The aim of this webinar is sort of to give you some direction, to identify certain good tools that I feel have actually enhanced my research and writing and my research productivity and to discuss some ethical issues related to the use of AI tools in medical research and writing. So when, once you guys use uh, AI tools in research and writing, what are the some specific barriers that you face? So can you like simply write them in the chat box? Specific barriers. Access, excellent. Alam Zeb has uh, uh, raised an excellent point. For most of the people develop, based in developing world, access is a major issue. Access because of finances, not everyone can afford to pay 20, 50, 60 dollars per month. General use answer, okay. Pay to access, uh, yes, alum good. Ethics, lack of proper referencing, okay. Some have subscription, yes. Almost every tool, uh, I mean, uh, almost every tool in order to explore their full functionality, you have to subscribe. And yes, subscription costs a lot of money and dollars. Generalized answer, fear of plagiarism, lack of knowledge, good, excellent, excellent. So we'll move forward, we'll move forward. So what is artificial intelligence? So again, um, I'm uh, I, I'm an old school. Uh, I mean, you can say I'm a eight, 1980s kid. So whenever, you know, I used to hear the word artificial intelligence, this what is used to come to my mind. You might recognize this. This is uh, T Terminator from the famous movie Terminator series by Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, uh, this was a confused movie for me uh, because of the first movie, uh, this guy came in to kill us. And then, you know, it in the next three, it came uh, to uh, save the humanity. 
but that's on a lighter note. So basically, artificial intelligence is a branch of computer science which is focused on creating intelligent machine that can perform tasks without explicit instruction using algorithm that learn and adapt from data. This is very, very important. Adaptation part, in real time, it adapts and it improves, it enhances, and it gives you an answer which is contextual to your own learning need, number one. Number two, you need to understand that, you know, you don't, this is a branch of computer science. So if your background is from medical science, social science, agriculture science, some other science not related to computer science, you do not need to get overwhelmed. You don't need to be an expert in every AI tool in order to explore these tools. I mean, I'm a medical doctor. I don't know, I mean, the basic ABC or how does an engine of a car works, but that does not stop me from using a car or a mobile phone. So you need to understand that. You don't need to go into the nitty gritty details of every large language model. You know how to use and drive that tool. That's good enough for you. And these tasks could include image recognition, NLP, decision making, generating, many things. So, but our focus is going to be on generative AI, which generates something. And this generation could be text generation, image generation, music, and video. We'll focus only on the text generation, for example, by chat GPT, Mistral, U.com which generates human-like text based on prompts. Prompts are instructions that you give to a large language model like ChatGPT. And image generation, very famous. You can use DAL-E, you can use Leonardo, you can use a co-pilot of Microsoft, and you can use a Gemini Pro of Google, and so many tools to create different kinds of images in less than 60 seconds. And sometimes you get actually four versions of those images, which was impossible to do before the era of AI. Before we move forward, because uh, I understand that most of us are based in the in developing world. So we need to understand, you know, our limitations. And probably we need to sort of like uh, go back in time and see our direction. Are we moving in the right direction or not? So just a quick uh, question. So when do you think that first time artificial intelligence was used in scholarly writing or research and writing purpose? When was that? Any guess? Can anyone guess? 2023, okay. No, Alam, that's very uh, uh, recent. It was a bit, a uh, uh, couple of uh, years back. 2020, okay. More than a decade, go back. 56, uh, Rehan, uh, please, uh, no, <laughs> I know you have attended my previous uh, webinar. So uh, I would request you not to like, uh, you know, like uh, give out the answers. Uh, wait till someone else has also answered. So thank you very much. Rehan is totally uh, correct. You need to understand that development of machine translation started in 1950s. Can you guys imagine that? That was 70 years back. Not a disrespect. I come from Pakistan. It's a developing world. We uh, gained independence in 1947. And I, I and the same goes for Kenya and most of the developing countries in Africa. Just imagine where were we 70 years back when people had actually started working on machine translation using a primitive form of artificial intelligence that was not as cool as the one that you and me use today, but it was artificial intelligence, the primitive artificial intelligence. And note that most of you, us use very commonly. The first version was launched in 1989. That was more than 35 years back. Then in 1990, around again uh, 32 uh, years ago, Natural language processing was used for the first time to generate summaries of research article. It was known as the paper digest system. Now it looks really cool that you go online, you use Humata, you can use Gemini Pro, you can use ChatGPT4 uh, 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 to uh, generate these summaries to extract information from large PDF files of 100 pages. But please remember, everything starts from a single step in the right direction. And they had taken this step back in 1990. The site seer system uh, came in around 2000. It, it was based on machine learning algorithm to automatically classify research article by topic, author, and other attributes. I'm going to give you an example from medical science, Medline or PubMed.com. You guys go online, online on PubMed. And on the left side, there is a, a option to restrict a full text, English only, humans, systematic review, clinical trials, stuff like that. It looks very really cool and easy. But you need to understand that this was this was not created overnight. It took more than 20 years till the time it became open to everyone, but people were working on that. And it was year 2010 once they started using AI to automate the process of generating text, the SciGen system. It was all primitive at the start. 
but at least it gives you and me sort of a idea and a time for introspection that where the world is moving, what they were doing and what we were and what are we doing. So you need to understand that the world is moving at a very fast pace. You have to catch up and you have to change direction. And it was actually in November 2022 when we woke up one morning and the world had changed. Why? Because Chat GPT version 3 was launched. When I say Chat GPT version 3, this means that three versions were actually in place before they made it open to public. They were working on that and that changed the world. And again, uh, in 2023, uh, this was one of the title that the year Chat GPT changed almost everything. And again, for those who are looking for jobs, it says there have been 20 times more jobs that list AI in the title or job description since Chat GPT premiered. And on a side note, I would request every one of you, whether you are a medical doctor, social scientist, agriculture, computer scientist, please go online. There are really good online courses available on Udemy, on Coursera, Future Learn and edX, on generative AI, on prompt engineering, on use of AI tools. And I would recommend that you must complete a couple of courses before you go out in the market out there. Because now AI is the buzzword. And if you have a couple of good courses, even if they're online courses on your CV, they are going to make you prominent among all other applicants who do not have any things to show that they have been formally trained in the use of artificial intelligence tools. So please think over it. Life is all about uh, making the best use of opportunity. You can discuss this right now, but within three months, by February 2022, more than 200 books were already available uh, on Amazon, Amazon books. I'm only talking about Amazon books, not global uh, book survey. And what people were doing, they were using chat GPT to create content and they were using the first version of DAL E to create images. And they combined both and they sent out uh, books and those books, you know, were uh, downloaded, they were bought and people made fortune. Life is all about making the best use of opportunity when it strikes. You keep on waiting, you keep on looking right and left, opportunity is going to slip by. And this was the reason that Time actually put ChatGPT on their front page. And you know, Time does not put anything on their front page for nothing. Having said that, we also need to understand that what are the potential benefits of using AI in scholarly writing. And for that, you need to understand what is the process of scholarly writing or research writing. So what are the different steps involved in writing a research article? Can you someone quickly like write it down different steps? Different steps in writing a research article. Title, okay. Can we go, uh, uh, Alam, can we go to the process? What is the process? How do we start different steps? So what is usually the first step? Proposal writing, yeah, okay. Identifying target journal, very important. Lead assessment, synopsis, okay. Literature review, excellent. Methodology, literature search. Identifying research gap, excellent. Selection topic, very good, yes, sir. Good, excellent. Discussion, go through literature, very good, excellent. Good, 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 nice. So usually you can uh, simple, if you want to simplify, I have simplified it for you. So you start with a literature search, then you read different articles, then out of those articles, you identify the research gaps, then you uh, go for your rationale, you create questionnaires, data collection tool, you go online or you go in the field and you collect data, then you have to do the data analysis, then comes the part of manuscript writing, and again, for people like you and me, uh, non-English speaking people, language, grammar, syntax is a major issue. References, citations, formatting of the article, and then obviously journal selection. The good news is artificial intelligence can help in each step of publishing a scientific manuscript. We need to understand the process. So if you want, I, I would like to give you some specific examples. Uh, oops, sorry, yeah. So first of all, you can use artificial intelligence for brainstorming research questions. And uh, yes, people are using a uh, chat GPT and uh, Gemini and uh, Copilot, but I'm going to give, uh, tell you about a very specific tool that has been recently developed by one of the Pakistani scholars based in uh, Norway or Denmark, uh, Mushtaq Bilal. It's an excellent tool specifically for brainstorming research question. Then these uh, LLM large language models are excellent in creating unique and interesting titles, both for your research, for your lectures, for your presentations and for any kind of interaction that you want to have with your audience. So please do try these things. Don't simply use this chat GPT to create articles that I'm going to give it a command. It's going to like move a magic wand and I'm going to get a whole article. That's not how it works. 
use it carefully to create unique and interesting titles. That's going to help you a lot. Then writing a outline or maybe a research proposal or synopsis, and then creating outlines for paper, presentation, workshop, and a disclaimer. I, ever since this chat GPT premiered, I am using both chat GPT and Gemini Pro version to create the outline of my lectures, of my paper, my presentation and workshop. And I must say it has actually enhanced my productivity and saved me a lot of time. Then it's a very important thing about this. I mean, if you're com I'm comfortable, I use that. I'm not saying you must use that, but I use chat GPT. Once we, uh, our group, any group that I'm working with, after getting their consent, once we are done writing the final draft of the article, the, uh, the draft that we write ourselves, we collect the data, we do the literature search, and then we start writing ourselves. Once we have written the draft and we say, oh yeah, okay, it's final from my side, from your side. Then we actually, at least I use these uh, chat GPT and Gemini Pro to review, critique, and get a feedback on the manuscript. I mean, it's tricky. Some people are not very comfortable. They say, um, I mean, our data goes online, stuff like that. If you're not comfortable, don't do that. I have been doing it with excellent results because I mean, you cannot even imagine the amount of knowledge that, you know, these large language models have. And they have actually a background of every known subject to humankind. They're not only medical doctors. They have background of medical science, agriculture science, social science, computer science, just name any science. And once it starts critiquing an article from that perspective, the comments are fantastic. I've been doing that. Then again, improving the quality of writing, grammar, language, syntax. And for that, you have to give it very good, carefully crafted prompts, which I'm going to show you. And for students and people who are doing their, maybe their bachelor program, their master program, uh, I mean, this is how life is. You don't get good teachers for every subject. I'm a teacher myself and I acknowledge that I'm not very good in some topics, right? I'm unable to maybe explain those topics in a language that my students can understand. So for initially, when I was a student, it was very frustrating. We never had these online tools, YouTube, stuff like that. For you guys, you can actually use these chat GPT and uh, other tools to learn and complex topics by simplifying the concepts, by asking it to create examples, contextual examples to your own specialty, subject and even your own country and it does that in a very good manner and obviously yes for preparing presentation which i frequently do so now i'm going to uh, quickly show you a couple of tools and uh, i'm going to share the link of the uh, presentation so you can download uh, this presentation and you can then uh, go online and explore all these links so the first is researchkick.com and again uh, a, a disclaimer i feel proud when i see this why because this is made by one of my uh, fellow countrymen, uh, Mushtaq Belal, who is into literature. He works in Denmark and he is a wonderful guy who is known around the globe for his AI webinars. His webinars are usually priced at 80 to 120 US dollars and usually 50 to 60 and in some cases 130 people attend his webinars by paying $100 each. And they're excellent, absolutely fantastic webinar. So Mushtaq Belal came up with this uh, research kick the good thing is, uh, you know, it, it has monthly packages and yearly packages. And if you're uh, based in a developing country like Pakistan, as you can see, hey, it looks you're from Pakistan. We support. So they are going to offer you discount. Usually it costs you $9 for 10,000 credits, which are good enough uh, to last you for at least six to seven different research projects. So please go online and explore Research Kick, specifically for creating research ideas and to refine research questions. Then Semantic Scholar. So most of us have been doing uh, 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 these uh, keyword-based literature search or the Boolean operator, the use of and or not. The world is moving toward semantic search. So anyone who has an idea, what is a semantic search? Anyone who has an idea, what is semantic search? Yeah, it's for literature, but I mean, what's the difference between semantic search and the Boolean search? Okay, so the Boolean was, you know, uh, the use of and or not, you combine different search terms, right? You different use keywords. Semantic is understanding the sentence itself. So, for example, if you say exercises for early rehabilitation of stroke patients, if you, you know your basic aim is that you want to know about the exercises for early rehabilitation of stroke patients. 
But if you use it in the traditional way, in the Boolean operator search, the, uh, uh, the search engine is going to break down into different search terms and you're going to get thousands of articles which might not be even related to that particular search term, right? So Semantic Scholar is basically the world first totally AI-based uh, artificial intelligence research engine. Uh, it is created by uh, Allen International AI. Uh, it was launched in 2018, just before COVID-19. And after COVID uh, and after uh, the launch of ChatGPT and other, it has been integrated with many AI tools. I would strongly recommend that please go online and see this different flavor of searching on Semantic Scholar. Can't go in detail, can't do a hand-on session, but it gives you a TLDR. That is a brief summary. It extracts information for you. It gives you citations. It gives you a, a step. Uh, it, it extracts separately the tables and the figure which you can easily use. It has got many functionalities that you must use if you want to enhance your literature search and uh, uh, literature searching. Then consensus is excel again an excellent tool, and you can actually uh, and the most important. I mean, people say that we don't find references. You don't use Chat GPT or maybe even Gemini to search for references and for research article. They are not made for that purpose. This uh, semantic scholar and consensus and also evidence hunt is the one that you should be using if you want to do a literature search, if you want to ask a question. If you want, want to get a specific answer to a question that has been in your mind. So don't use chat GPT, use evidence hunt, use consensus and use semantic scholar. Anyone who has an idea, what is literature mapping? What is literature mapping? Okay. So most of us already uh, very familiar with literature search, literature synthesis, literature writing. A uh, new concept is literature mapping, which I uh, must say you must explore and you must actually start doing literature search this man in, in this way. It is basically a way of discovering scholarly article by exploring connection between different publications. So whenever we do a literature search, let's say on Medline, on PubMed, uh, I mean, you only get a, a article title, abstract, and maybe related uh, articles. If you do a literature search, let's say on Google Scholar, you would also get, you know, how to cite that and how many publications have cited that. But you would not know or understand what is the deeper connection between different articles. Because sometimes, and I'm also guilty of that, you simply quote an article just because it is there. You don't quote it uh, based on some information or some deeper understanding of the article. You simply quote and cite the article. So the article is cited, but there's no deeper connection. And if someone wants to explore, that it, there is, is there really any connection between the article that is written and the article that is cited it, it will be unable to like explore that connection. And literature mapping would allow you that. And again, there are many tools, but one uh, the top three uh, tools. And again, the good thing is that, you know, all three are available as a uh, freeware as well. So most of their functions are available for free, but then if you want to go one step further, you have to buy a subscription. And for all of these three, Mushtaq and other people who are into AI business, they are offering discount codes up to 40% off. So as you can see, this is a map. And in this map, some are bigger dots and some are smaller dots. So this is a central article in the uh, middle, Fan et al. 2006. And as you can see that, you know, how closely articles are connected to this main article. So this is site. Then Research Rabbit is again totally free. And it's again a very important tool for literature mapping. And this is how it, and lit, the good thing about Research Rabbit is it integrates with your Zotero library as well. So you can actually move between your Zotero library and your collection in Research Rabbit. Again, this is how it, you can see again, uh, Eckert 2017 and how closely it is related to different articles. So it creates literature map. And again, Connected Paper is also another app. So you stick to these three, site, connected paper and research rabbit, and it's going to serve your purpose very well. Then sometime, you know, not sometime, most of the time you're short of time and you have to do so many things. You have an office, you have a family, you have friends to I mean, meet, you have parents to whom you want to take care of, you have to take time off, and there are like 50 articles that you have to read in the next one week. How can you do that humanly? Sometimes it becomes impossible. So people used to do some tricks they used to skim, they used to skip, they used to only read the abstract. But again, now AI tools have given us an option to 
live to do some live interaction with these PDF files. So you can again do hours worth of reading in minutes. And again, SciSpace, which is typeset.io, is an excellent tool which helps you extract information, collate information, write information, and then compare different article based on the parameter that you want to extract from the two from the article. For example, you want to say, I, I want to know about the methodology. I want to know about the limitations. I want to know about the conclusion. And you have 20 articles in front of you. You upload all of them, and it's going to create a table for you with different rows and column. And every column will have the specific information that you were asking for. Initially, you and me had to write and read for hours and sometimes days in order to extract that information. Now, AI has given us an option to extract that information within minutes. A disclaimer that still you, it's your responsibility to verify that whether that extraction is accurate or not, but it does make your life pretty easy. Again, one of my favorite, Numata. Numata, again, a free online tool, at least free, I mean to say that, you know, the functionality that you and me require is going to uh, be fulfilled by the free version of Numata. And again, Humata allows you interaction with your PDF. You upload your PDF and then you start interacting with this AI tool and whatever answer you, uh, whatever question you ask, please summarize this article for me. Please mention five highlight of this article. What are the limitation of this article? What is the research methodology used in this article? Uh, what are the counter arguments mentioned in this article? It's going to extract every information with reference and it's going to highlight those parts which it has referenced in yellow. So again, an excellent tool, Humata. Then someone uh, talked about online journal selection tools. Yes, uh, things have been uh, pretty uh, streamlined and you can either go online or collaborate. So Collaborate is the same organization that gives impact factor to different journals. So they have a manuscript matcher in which you can actually uh, put in your title or the abstract and it's going to mix and match uh, from its own database. A very uh, useful tool and free to use for everyone. But my favorite is Jane, journal author name estimator. As you can see, you can find journals, you can find author, you can find articles. You can either uh, search by using keywords or you can search by using your title and abstract. And it gives you a list of articles and for medical uh, doctors here or healthcare professionals, medical uh, people here in the webinar, it gives you a list of articles that are indexed in Medline, that is the PubMed. It gives you, an, uh, it highlights those in the PubMed, uh, PubMed Central, and it also gives you a highlight which articles are open access. So again, a very useful tool. Uh, people often ask that, you know, uh, how can we create presentation? Again, a disclaimer, uh, you should or you can use uh, uh, these tools to create good presentation or outline, but please don't blindly rely and simply copy you. There are more than 35 PowerPoint presentation tools available out there. And at least on LinkedIn, these influencers for the clickbait, they are going to say PowerPoint is dead. No, PowerPoint is not dead. It is going to stay here. Nothing in the, at least, uh, I mean, this is my personal opinion. Nothing uh, in the AI realm right now beats a PowerPoint presentation. The customization and the thing that we can do with PowerPoint, especially if you have subscription to Office 365. But having said that, my personal favorite and is Gamma, why? Because Gamma would allow you to download your presentation as PowerPoint. Most of other would not allow you to create more than eight presentations. Some will not allow you to download the presentation. So what's the fun if I cannot download the presentation? And some of uh, uh, would uh, let you uh, download in form of PDF, which is practically useless because you can't uh, uh, customize the presentation. So there are more than 30 tools. I have been using three. My personal favorite is Gamma. Then I have also used slide go and I have also used this slide pilot. So again, uh, you can use any one of them that you like. Having said that you need to understand this is not uh, a magic wand and there are some potential drawbacks or limitation or concerns. And uh, honestly speaking, some people are just using AI tools like this monkey. So they have, a, they don't a white coat. They have a stack. They sit on a laptop and they just start grinning. And this thing that, you know, just by typing, they're going to create something. Don't be a monkey, right? Be a human being who sensibly uses artificial intelligence tools to enhance his or her research productivity instead of blindly following the content that AI generates. So the first concern is of 
uh, ownership and uh, ownership and authorship so my first question to you all can uh, 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 chat gpt be listed as a co-author why not alam why not yes no why okay a quick question yes it should be right okay yes no yes no uh, can uh, you guys give me a sort of like uh, explanation why it should be a co-author and why it should not be a co-author no because ai has not accountability as a good excellent so as in uh, you actually like uh, you know you gave the answer so we need to understand <clears throat> that this is the standard criteria of international committee of medical journal editors at least for medical sciences i mean any kind of medical science nursing medicine dentistry allied healthcare science physical therapy just name any medical science this is the criteria that is globally used this criteria clearly says substantial contribution to the conception design analysis interpretation drafting the work revising it critically if you pause for a moment artificial intelligence is actually doing couple of these task it contributes to the conception it gives you ideas it can design the work it can analyze the data it can interpret the data it can draft the work it can revise it critically provide you with really good feedback but you need to understand two criteria all final approval and accountability for all aspect of the work that is being published and an ai tool or a large language model cannot be held accountable initial in, in the initial 3 to 4 months there were three or four articles in medline and one of them were a very famous nursing journal article that listed chat gpt as a co-author that was the initial time things were not clear now things have become very clear the instructions are out there the guidelines are out there and they clearly say that chat gpt do not currently satisfy our authorship criteria which is the icmj criteria an attribution of authorship carries it with accountability for the work which cannot be effectively applied to a large language model this uh, editorial two page by thorpe is an excellent editorial free of cost available online i would request please go online and explore that the uh, summary is chat gpt is fun but it cannot be listed as an author because of lack of accountability and zbir policy allows the use of ai tool to improve the readability and language of the research article but not to replace key tasks that should be done by the author such as interpreting the data or drawing scientific conclusion so there are certain things that you can delegate to the ai but there are certain things that human beings need to do because this is what human beings do we lead from the front we create we are we have creative minds so don't become a dull monkey that sits in front of a computer and start typing right and this this is world association of medical editors Uh, it has uh, clearly given its guidelines about the chat box chat bots use of generative ai in scholarly manuscript and it clearly says you can use ai but you cannot list it as a co-author and aizen says i think the better question is not whether to allow it but how to manage the fact it is being used and the most important thing for now at least is for author to be very upfront so please be transparent please be ethical and please declare how you have used artificial intelligence in enhancing your article this is a very important concern that has been uh, voiced by many teachers many uh, uh, people who are into ai and uh, education that is creativity some people think that the idea of an ideal ai tool is that person is relaxing on the beach why i ai tools create article and also bring them a uh, coconut juice this is not how ai works because you need to understand the end does not justify the mean we are not concerned that you create an article as teachers as educator we are more concerned that whether you have followed the process have you understood the steps of creating a research article have you gone through that grill have you done that steps have you gone out in the field that is more important because focus on the journey and not the destination joy is found not in finishing activity but in doing it you learn by doing writing 2 3 4 50 100 articles is not a destination your actual aim is to understand how to do the process and that process is going to bring you joy that process is going to bring you education that process is going to enhance your skills and that's going to make you a better professional so please focus on the journey and not on the destination the process of writing at the minimum include three things 
reading, critical analysis, and writing. And please remember, these all three things can easily be done by an artificial intelligence tool. But you also need to understand these were the three things that made human beings the dominant species on planet Earth. Until the time we stick to these three things, we will remain the dominant species. You simply can't uh, I mean, sort of like uh, outsource everything to AI. Reading. Once you read, it uh, uh, makes your own concept clear. Read, readers are better writers. Critical analysis means that you're critically analyzing the reading, whether it is right or wrong. And how do you interpret that? And in the end comes the process of writing. So uh, uh, animals can do everything. They can't read, they can't write, and they can't do a critical analysis of the book which you place in front of them. So please do not outsource everything to artificial intelligence because then your creativity is going to go down the drain. Technical and accessibility challenges. Yes, there are challenges. I mean, financial challenges. I mean, not everyone can uh, afford 20, 30, 40, 50 US dollar every month. Then, you know, uh, at least I'll give you one quick example. I wanted to get subscription of ChatGPT4. It took me 10 days before they gave me subscription. And uh, my colleague uh, uh, based in Korea got it in less than one minute. Uh, I mean, my colleagues in Kenya have access to Claude and by Anthropic. It's also a very good large uh, LLM. We in Pakistan do not have access to uh, this uh, uh, the Claude 3. I mean, this is how it is. So accessibility and technical challenges. And last but not the least, bias and discrimination. And again, the example that I always give, uh, in the initial times when these uh, tools were launched, one of the tools was asked to create a picture of a poor child in different scenarios. It created four different pictures. Can someone tell me what kind of child was that in the picture? What kind of child was in that picture? Yes. Unfortunately, it was an African child in four different backgrounds. A beach, a shanty, a city. Why? This bias and discrimination was fed to this AI tool that, you know, okay, this uh, uh, an African child is synonymous with poverty. It was wrong. But the point is what you and me can do. I, I, uh, I mean, for example, many Pakistani colleagues say, you know, whenever we want to create a contextual document and we want to ask a contextual question to an LLM, we don't get many good answers from Pakistan. Why? Because you and me are responsible. How much you have contributed to the global pool of knowledge that becomes the basis for feeding the LLM. If 99% of the knowledge is from European context, American context, Australian context, Japanese context, then why would an African or a Pakistani or an Indian or a Nepalese person complain that, you know, these LLM don't give us contextual answers? So probably it brings me to the point that it is an ethical responsibility for every researcher, whether you are a medical researcher, computer science, agriculture, social science based in a developing country. Please contribute to the global pool of knowledge. Please write. Please publish. Why? Because the more you publish, the more you are going to contribute to the global pool of knowledge and we can address this bias and discrimination in AI tool output to some extent. I mean, you can't uh, match the 95% which is available out there, but at least you and me can do our part. So this is the only solution that I can think of. Uh, these are a couple of uh, AI terminologies that you need to understand. Prompts are written instruction provided to learning model to generate desired output. And again, prompt engineering is the process. And I would again request all of you to please go online on Udemy, edX, Coursera, and Future Learn to do a couple of courses in prompt engineering. Then there is a concept of hallucination, which is an output that may sound plausible, but they're either factually incorrect, misleading, or unrelated to the given context. And again, this is uh, again uh, something to understand that the free version hallucinate more as compared to the pro versions. Pro versions are definitely better and they definitely hallucinate less as compared to free versions. Last but not the least, I'm going to quickly, I mean, before, I mean, we are almost, but uh, uh, it's time. So this is basically, you can say a chat. So what is your understanding of a chat? Or what is, what makes a good chat? What is a chat and what makes a good chat? Two-way conversation, excellent. 
understanding communication connection excellent good anything else what makes a good chat which makes sense relative prompt good anything else so chat is basically exchange of information and talking between two people initially it was for two people in case of an ai tool it is one person and an ai bot or a chat bot so what makes a good chat a good chat which starts with introduction you have to get to know each other you explain what you want to know from the other person and then you give feedback and then you make connection and if you use the same framework with chat gpt or maybe any other large language model you are going to get good answers so unfortunately people simply start giving a single liner and then they expect that this large language model having billions of like uh, information uh, uh, nodes is going to give them the exact answer they are looking for no it doesn't work like that you have to create an excellent and a good prompt and again writing prompt is one of my whole session of 1 to 2 hours but again just to give you a framework how to write good prompts number 1 please give clear and specific instructions number 2 add as many details as you can i'll give you one example quick uh, i'll give you example later on then you have to give example and templates if available and then you give feed once it gives you a output you give feedback is the uh, output good is the output bad what do you want the output to be changed into or the output was excellent and you want the next output to be very similar to this one so again give feedback and please you can't get your desired output in a single iteration you have to do it again and again and again this is how it works i mean nothing comes for i mean uh, on a single click you have to improve right and this is a framework that you know i would request you to use and if you use this framework it's going to make the quality of your output if not excellent very good and to the point first of all you have to give it a role or a persona then you have to uh, sort of like uh, give it a background and experience then you clearly say what is the task that this llm has to perform then you specify what is the output that you require you require uh, maybe uh, and a graph you require uh, uh, enumerated uh, uh, these um, uh, numbering you require a paragraph or whatever tables and then you set the tone tone could be professional tone could be academic tone could be informal tone could be funny and there are so many things so this is a prompt framework that if you use it's going to enhance the quality of the output that you would get the last is you know we most of the people are stuck with chat gpt chat gpt is one of the best out there there's no sort of like uh, second uh, uh, thought about that but you need to understand there are many alternative to chat gpt available uh, i am using gemini uh, there are two versions gemini free or gemini advanced or gemini pro again excellent then you can also use copilot and copilot the advantage of copilot is it is available free of cost and it is also very good and it is by microsoft then cloud by anthropic unfortunately not available in pakistan unless you use a vpn but i just checked it is available in kenya uh, then uh, and uh, probably nigeria as well and then mistral is basically from france and it's also an excellent tool the uh, again ai chatbot that you might want to explore and i started using you uh, dot com just like 10 days back and i must say it is a sort of an excellent alternative to everything that i have just told you why can you see uh, this thing smart genius gpt4 turbo research create number 1 it has different modes that's the beauty of u.com number 2 it gives you references especially in the create and res in the research mode and number 3 uh, uh, the same 20 dollar subscription will get you access to everything chat gpt4 uh, this uh, chat gpt4 cloud 3 uh, uh, this uh, microsoft copilot and everything else so it's an excellent alternative if you are short of money you might want to uh, buy a subscription of u.com and then you can sort of like explore all these things that i have just told you and last but not the least because i just told you it is overwhelming and there are hundreds and thousands of tools available out there this is a very good website known as there is an ai for that.com and if you uh, sort of like go there Uh, it gives you alternative to the ai tool that you are searching and it gives you many good alternatives so please go online and explore there is an ai for that the summary is that ai has been a part of scholarly writing for a long period of time more than two decades 
there are variety yes. of options available to researchers. It is here to stay and will evolve. So you need to understand how AI tools should be used, the ethical, transparent use of AI tools, and then start using them. And uh, it can actually enhance the search productivity and quality. The take home message is please use AI as your research assistant and helper and not as your teacher or master, which dictates to you something. Um, the mic is open for some colleague. Please uh, just uh, uh, mute it. Thank you. Do not blindly rely on AI generated content. If there is something problem, it you will be held responsible. Be transparent about the use of AI in research and writing. Be proactive and learn the use of AI tools. This is a skill and you cannot learn a skill what? by a lecture that I just gave you. Skill can only improve by practice. Yes. Remember, change is inevitable. Growth is optional. Artificial intelligence is not going to replace humans, but humans who actively use artificial intelligence are going to replace humans without AI All because right. of their research much, productivity. Okay. And uh, it does not matter how many resources you have. If you don't know how to use them, it will never be enough. So I stop here. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm going to share with you guys two things. Uh, okay. Jyoti, I'm done. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, ma. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Dr. Dhoti, I'm done. Uh, so if we can take the question and answers. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Faru, for that very interesting presentation. Uh, I like that. I did not know what I'm talking about. Dr. Dhoti, please come here. Welcome. Okay. I'm sharing the feedback link and also the link to download the presentation. So you guys can uh, do that. And I'm uh, Rehan, can you uh, unmute yourself and ask the question? Uh, hello. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Farooq, for a wonderful session. And we learned a lot of things from you. Uh, actually, I have a question. Like, uh, suppose I am using ChatGPT to proofread my uh, research work. Like, I have written a manuscript and then I want to run it through ChatGPT. So, is ChatGPT is end to end encrypted? Like, suppose, uh, or uh, ChatGPT will take my work and it will share with anyone else as well uh, does it is end to end encryption because like uh, i may be using it for my final manuscript yeah uh, first of all honestly i am not sure about this end to end encryption but one thing is very clear that you know whatever you upload to chat gpt is your own responsibility whatever you load chat gpt and other large language models are going to use it to train themselves they are not going to like uh, i mean uh, share that manuscript with someone else but honestly speaking, in 2024, you cannot say what the future holds for us. I've just told you, I do take this risk. Why? Because I think when I weigh the uh, risk and uh, the, I mean, the pros and cons, I think that this chat GPT and the large language model like Gemini have substantially improved the quality of my writing. So I am pretty comfortable in sharing manuscript. When I'm not comfortable, I uh, don't share the whole manuscript. I share it in small chunks. And I don't share it in a single go. I usually then share it in like, uh, uh, if I say I do the introduction on day one, I'll do the discussion on day two, I'll do the methodology on day three. So again, it's not a foolproof method, but this keeps me at least comfortable that this thing is not going to like go out because they don't share their data with someone. They actually train on other people's data. So I'm comfortable. I do that. Uh, okay. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Uh, can I ask a question? This is, yeah, uh, this is me, Fozio. This is me, Fozio, from Ziaudin University. Uh, I have, thank you for a wonderful session. I have a question. When I use Chat GPT for manuscript writing or any document, when I run a plagiarism for the document, it shows AI. When I use Kill Ball to remove the AI, but uh, but the AI is again not removed. Is there any another AI tool to remove the AI from that document, like manuscript? Hey, Dr. Fossey, then, uh, again, my perspective, my, again, my perspective is the same. And I told you, this is not a hands-on session because in my hands-on session, I actually uh, teach or train people how to write a manuscript using your own words. Because if you use AI, totally AI to generate manuscript, that is, uh, first of all, not ethical. You have to write the manuscript yourself. You can enhance the manuscript by using these tools, but you cannot use AI to totally generate a content. It will always be labeled as AI generated content and there's no shortcut. 
I mean, there are certain tools and there are certain custom made GPTs which are available only with chat GPT for subscription that humanize the tone or humanize the content. But having said that, uh, again, uh, uh, I would still say that use your own imagination to create content and then use AI tools to improve the quality of your manuscript. This is how it should work because totally relying on AI tool to generate uh, text, all the text probably is not appropriate. This is what I think. And there are certain Thank you. GPTs Thank which, you. You can, which you can use. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the answer, detailed answer. Okay, Saad uh, has asked a question. I wanted to ask whether journals run an AI detection of the manuscript. Do, uh, I'm not sure again. I'm not sure about the policy. Dr. Wajid is here. He's a, a editor of a journal. Uh, most of the journal probably don't do that. But I would say, please do not take risk. One year ago, people were not, even editors were not aware of the AI tools. Now, editors and people and researchers and teachers are and universities are very well aware of AI tools. And nobody likes when whole of your article is uh, flagged as 90% AI generated content. So don't take any risk. Uh, Dr. Farooq Athur, thank you for so, this nice uh, uh, session on AI. Uh, actually, I'm following the, like uh, different uh, people on LinkedIn who give such nice uh, instruction how to use it. The main thing is uh, like, how can we use it ethical? There are a lot of debates on uh, using it ethically. Uh, because we can use, as you told, that we should use this at, as it uh, like like someone uh, who can help us in, in writing, like, for example, making uh, your writing coherent and cohesive, not as like just um, writing something and taking it out and just pasting it in our uh, research articles. Because at the end of the day, if there is any problem, I will be responsible, not the not chat GPT. Yes. yes. This morning I was reading uh, like uh, in MDPI, guidelines on, uh, on using chat GPT, like uh, they <laughs> updated some new instructions. Like for example, if you submitted an article and you received comments from uh, reviewers, you cannot use uh, those, like let's say if a reviewer says something, I want to answer. You cannot copy the reviewer's comments and paste into chat GPT to reproduce uh, the, the answer for you because it's not ethical because uh, reviewer agree that this response should be anonymous it should not go anywhere so this was uh, this uh, this thing that i was reading this morning just to i mean update the audience about that excellent so, dr Feld, thank you very much for updating and i i would request uh, all of you to please go online as Topel have said there you know there are many good people on uh, linkedin who are sharing different updates and at the end of the day it is the responsibility of the person him or herself whether you are an educator a student a teacher a researcher uh, it is your responsibility to remain updated about the rapidly changing artificial intelligence landscape in research and writing. There are many good organizations out there, COPE, uh, then there is this uh, VEMI, and there are uh, a Council of Science Editor Europe, who are an Elsevier and Swingerlink, who are regularly updating their instruction to author and the use of AI tool. So before you start writing an article for a particular journal, it is a good idea to see what instructions are specifically available on the use of AI tools. And if you have any confusion, it is again a good idea to email the editor to ask about the guidance. So please don't take anything for granted and be, be very clear that what you want to do. Uh, Jazz Limited has a hands up so you can ask a question. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Sir, my name is Hamid. I am a recent medical graduate from Kadiazam Medical College. Sir, uh, I want i want to say sir uh, how uh, sir sorry sir sir is earning potential kya is a, is a, uh, in medical and in writing and research earning potential again uh, again they go um, uh, uh, hamid na ji ji sir ji ha ah. acha hamid uh, if you talk of earning potential honestly speaking again i'll go back to mushtaq i'll go back to mushtaq bilal Mushtaq, uh, please go online and follow on LinkedIn Mushtaq Bilal. He, a couple of weeks or months back, okay, he actually shared his journey on the use of AI tools. He has earned uh, okay. probably more than 50,000 US dollars in one year just by doing online webinars. But then you need to understand he spends a lot of time on LinkedIn. He creates excellent content. So again, it's not about learning potential. Everything in this world has a learning and earning potential. And if there's a need for that, and we all know that there's a need for learning and teaching AI tools. So if you're really good in that, 
I'm sure you can earn a lot just like Mushtaq did. One year, more than 50,000 US dollars, which most of us will not be making maybe the next five years. So yes, it's got a lot of earning potential. Uh, he also made his own AI app called Research Kick. If you yes, know that. yes, yes. Research Kick is his app. Yeah, so he's earning from that as well. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. Any other question? Because we are all already running uh, 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 over time. So over to you, Dr. Ruharti. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Farooq. That was a very interesting um, presentation, quite uh, informative. And thank you very much for your time in preparing this. So uh, a lot of people have been asking if the recordings will be shared. Yes, the recordings will be shared on our YouTube channel, the Auto International Research Hub, to be shared there. And um, Dr. Farooq, I believe you'll also be giving us the your presentation. Yes, I have just, uh, I, I'm going to share it again. So this is the link to my okay. uh, yeah, presentation. I've just shared it. I'm going to share with you again uh, separately as well. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. So I'll look forward to that. And then we also uh, share it to our members. So thank you so much. Um, thank you again for the opportunity. Th thank you so much. That was a very brilliant presentation. We appreciate that. So please send your feedback about the uh, this webinar, share it with us on our LinkedIn page or on the uh, WhatsApp group for those of you who are with us on the on the WhatsApp group. All right, so um, we just like to close right now. I want to appreciate you, Dr. Farouk, once again for your time. And then for, I mean, I thought I knew so much about AI for your presentation, with your presentation. It has given me, well, new knowledge and a lot of new tools that I can use in academic writing. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, Dr. Farouk. And thanks to everyone who has taken time out to attend this webinar. We appreciate you all. Thank you so much. And have a lovely evening and a good evening. Thank you all. Bye.